Hey everyone, the time has come for a custom painting guide and in this video I'm going to focus specifically in detail on how to spray with a spray gun and a compressor. I've had a lot of requests for this video. I know a lot of you are wanting to step it up from spray cans, which basically all modders use, understandably, because a spray gun and a compressor setup is quite expensive. It's something that you're only going to do if you're doing a lot of modding and painting. You know, I spend a day in the booth, spray booth, per week on average, and I have been for the past five years. Prior to that, I was using spray cans, and I've used spray cans on countless jobs. You know, you can get a decent, acceptable result with spray cans, there's no doubt about that. But if you really want to step it up, if it's kind of a production line like what I'm doing here, where there's a lot of it, then a spray gun and a compressor is the only way to go. It's going to give you access to a far wider range of paints. Some of the really nice, you know, special effects, pearls, candies, metallics, different types of paint, you know, acrylic, two-pack, there's just no limits to it. Chromes, even glow-in-the-dark paint. And it's also going to enable you to, I mean, do all different types of finishes. Some of that you can do with spray cans, but you're never going to achieve that perfect, you know, minimal orange peel, extremely high gloss finish. There's no doubt that with a, a spray gun and a compressor, you're going to be able to get the best finishes. So let's get into it. We'll start with spray guns. It's really, you know, the very first thing you're going to be doing when you are doing experimental pieces, you know, and that's how I started just doing spraying scrap pieces of metal and no one even told me what, how the settings worked. I just kind of experimented trial and error and figured it out for myself and found the best settings to use. But yeah, that's what you're going to be doing to start with, getting those settings right on the gun. So I'm now going to teach you how those settings work. We have a, a few guns here. This is the first gun that I started with. This is a sub $100 gun. And you know, any professional painter can pick up pretty much any gun, even a cheap and nasty gun, and get a similar result. But to get that last 5% of quality, even 10% of quality, a nicer gun is definitely going to help and you know make that possible. But this is really all you need. Just a $100 gun or even less is going to be enough to get you started, to get you experimenting and learning and playing around. So that's probably what I suggest to start with. And then once you really start pushing it, trying to improve the finish, get those perfect, extremely high gloss show car finishes. When you start experimenting with special effects and you know, literally experimental paints, because when I say special effects, there's no limits to what you can do. I mean, these here didn't actually work out, but I was experimenting with a, a chrome paint and you lay down a layer of black, then the chrome, and then you can go over this with candy, which is semi-transparent, you know, then some flake. I mean, there's just no limits to how you can combine different paints to get different effects. And this one also didn't really work out, but it's a silver flare, silver metallic with a black candy over the top. So yeah, I stepped up to a $500 gun, the Develbis GTI Pro, and there's no doubt I was able to improve my finish by at least 10%, particularly the high gloss finishes, you know, less orange peel, and I was a lot, became a lot more confident with special effects and I started playing around with a lot more kind of difficult paints. But yeah, you don't need something like this. Uh, and someone said to me just a couple of days ago, not everyone can afford such a nice gun. Well, you need to consider that if I was spraying a Case Labs TH-10A, and I do a lot of those, I spray a lot of Case Labs cases, the materials for that paint job are more expensive than this gun. So if something goes wrong with that paint job, you know, the gun's going to pay for itself very quickly. That's really the way to think about it. If something is going to help you to improve quality and achieve a better result and also do a paint job with kind of less risk of things going wrong and you're doing a lot of it, then there's just no question about it. 
something that you definitely need to do. Now you can see this pressure gauge here. You're going to have a pressure gauge on your compressor, which kind of is enough, but you know, then you have an airline and it, who knows what your airline length will be. Maybe it's 15 meters, maybe it's 10. I think mine is 10 meters. Well, there can be pressure differences between the compressor and the gun due to the length of the airline. And you cannot have pressure differences. The pressure needs to be consistent. It needs to be the same every time you spray. It's very important. It needs to be absolutely spot on. So let's look at the adjustments and how to set up your gun for spraying. The adjustments on all guns are going to be basically the same. Some of the cheaper guns will be minus an adjustment and sometimes they'll be in different places. For example, with these two guns, this adjustment is here in the same place, but then on these two guns, it's on the side. So, you know, they're really the only differences you're going to run into. So let's start with the pressure gauge, which you are, you really should have, I highly recommend it. Here you have an adjustment for pressure. And so whatever you've set the pressure at at the compressor, you can adjust a pressure here, anything below that, obviously. And, you know, you can get a very accurate to within like a couple of PSI pressure. Then this one here is air volume. Kind of important, but a lot of people just wind that all the way out and leave it all the way out you know, maximum air volume, and then they only worry about adjusting the pressure. But uh, I'll come back to how to actually, what to set these two. And then these two up here, the bottom one, this one here, is the amount of paint. And then this one here is the fan. So, you know, how wide the spray is that comes out. Okay, so let's look at how to set these up. Now, this depends on so many different variables. And this is where we really start to get into some difficult and detailed territory. Now, you're probably wondering why I have so many different guns. So let's start there. This gun here has a 1.3 millimeter nozzle. So this gun is for base coat and top coat. So, you know, the colors, the special effects, the clear coat. And that's why it has a, a smaller nozzle. Now nozzles range from roughly 0.8 of a millimeter, I think, up to two millimeters and maybe a little bit more. This gun here is a touch-up gun and it's actually for spraying chrome paints. As you can see there, it's a chrome gun. And so it has a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, very small. So this is designed for spraying in very small areas or extremely thin paints, which chrome paint is very, very thin. This gun here is a primer gun. It has a two millimeter nozzle. And that is because just about all primers are designed so that you can thicken them up or you know thin them out. And they usually have some different ratios on the container that kind of give you different options for it to just be a primer, a primer filler, you know, different types of primer. But if you have a bit of a rough surface, if there's some pit marks and scratches that you still need to get rid of, well, you can actually use the primer as a filler and then sand it back again. And, you know, let's say you've used a filler on a car bog and there's still some issues with it, then you'll use a primer filler over it. There's a, quite a lot of situations where you'll need to use a thick primer. And that's what this big two mil nozzle is actually for. But most of the time, I don't really use this gun. I never really needed it. It's a, f a lot cheaper gun than this one, but it's still a nice Devolbis. It's the SGK 600PR HVLP gun. I, yeah, usually just thin the primer out and use this gun as an all-rounder for everything, and it works great for me. So, you know, the, the nozzle is certainly one variable that you're going to have to consider, but I recommend a 1.3 or 1.4 mil nozzle and just use it as an all-rounder and just thin the paints out to the point where things work for you, but trial and error, experimentation. So, the pressure. Now what I do, if I'm spraying 
a primer. It'll be about 25 PSI. Base coat, 25 PSI. Clear coat, about 28 to 30 PSI. So for a clear coat, I turn up the pressure a bit. And yeah, that's this adjustment here on the actual pressure gauge. Now the air volume, a lot of people, as I said, just wind this all the way out and leave it. You can try that, but if you're getting a lot of overspray, and let's say you're spraying inside of a case, you know, inside of a box in a confined area, a really small area, like a hundred mil by a hundred mil box with one side open and you're trying to get in there and you've got all this air volume coming through. Well, the paint's going to swirl around and dry out and then land back on the surface and you're going to get this dusty, sandy finish, which is absolutely terrible. And I see this even with pro painters when they try to paint cases because they're used to painting cars they always get this wrong and you always get that sandy finish, but that's where you can turn this down. And I actually run this constantly, turn down one and a half to two turns. So I suggest you experiment with turning down the volume. Now, when you turn down the air volume, the pressure changes. So then you need to go back and adjust that pressure to, you know, 25 to 30 PSI or, yeah, as I say, many variables here, but this is just a starting point. Just some settings to, you know, get you started. Now, when it comes to the paint, every single time I wind that out three turns. Sometimes I'll drop it down to two and a half. If I'm in a really confined area and there's, you know, there's a bit too much paint coming out, I will turn down the pressure, the air volume and the paint. But yeah, it's something to experiment with, but start with three turns. The fan, just leave it wound all the way out every time. Never change the fan. You know, you're going to get overspray. You don't want to be turning the fan down to try to avoid overspray because there's so many other variables. When you turn the fan down, you know, then you have a lot more paint in a smaller area. So then you need to turn the paint down and then you need to turn the pressure down. And yeah, it's just too much. So just leave the fan fully open. Okay, so to sum it up, fully open on the fan, three turns out on the paint, one and a half to two turns out on the volume, 25 to 30 PSI on the pressure. So that's pretty much it. That will get you started with your gun. So I have a bunch of panels here which have been sanded, cleaned up, they're ready to spray. These are actually from the Corsair Crystal 570X. And then in the booth, I have this motherboard tray is from the Fractal Define R5. And then I have a bunch of custom panels that I've built for the R5. That one back there, this one here, power supply shroud. This is for another build. It's a custom res mounting plate. This is the back of a Case Labs Mercury S5. This is the front panel of the Fantex N2 Evolve. So yeah, a lot of spraying to do here today. And they first need to be hit with primer. So here I have my materials for all of the different spray jobs that I'm working on right now because the panels that I just showed you, they're going to all be different colors. So let's start with the primer. Now I'm using a uh, DNA 2K, 2-pack two primer. I use 2-pack paints. I started with acrylics and I really don't like acrylics. They're very soft, they chip easily, not very durable, difficult to spray as well. You know, you get a lot more orange peel, you get a lot more paint in the air. 2-pack is the way to go, but it's more expensive. So if, when you're doing your practice pieces, use some cheap, nasty acrylic paint. And then when you start spraying for real, switch over to the two pack and then suddenly you'll find that it's a lot easier to spray because this paint certainly is from my experience. But this is a, a two pack primer. So it comes with a hardener and a reducer. So, you know, once you mix the hardener, that's it. You've only got a little bit of time to spray it. And it has the mixing ratio on the side. So you know how to mix it and see I was talking about using a, a primer as a filler. It says here four part HS primer, one part HS hardener. 
one part HS reducer when used as primer surfacer. So what that means is you add the reducer, to th which is thinners, to thin it out when you're using it as a primer surfacer. Wow, that hardener is so hard that it actually just put a splinter into my thumb. Okay, so then I'll be spraying base coat. And I'm not sure, like, th they're going to have different terminology depending on where you are in the world. But the type of paint this is, is just referred to as base coat. So even though you're using two-pack paints, the colors, you know, it'll usually just be called base coat. And for my base coat, I usually use this DuPont for pretty much everything, unless I'm doing special effects, and then I'll use DNA. You know, if I'm, I always use DNA candy, but when it's metallics, pearls, I don't know. What you need to do is, is go into your local paint shop and talk to them about materials. Say you want to use two-pack paint, and you know you want to play around with some special effects, metallics, pearls, candies. You want a, a high quality, durable paint and tell them what you're going to be using it for and, and they'll generally point you in the right direction. So with the base coat, you also have to mix this. You have to mix it with a thinner. And so I have the thinner here. And unlike the, the two pack, it will keep. So you, you can't just mix this with the hardener and then put it away. It's going to go hard whether it's in a tin or not. This, you're only adding a, re a reducer, a thinner. So, you know, once you've thinned it, you can keep it for like years, pretty much. So after the base coat, there might be multiple coats of different base coat, you know, with special effects. For example, on, on the Corsair Crystal 570X, I'm going to be spraying it with a white base coat and then a white pearl but then you're going to be spraying clear coat and that's back to two pack again. And I use this DNA custom clear, which is quite expensive. It's definitely the highest quality paint on the market. This stuff is just amazing. So you can see the mixing ratio there, flash off time, dry time. You know, it's pretty much all there. It tells you how to mix it. But for this one, you don't need to mix a reducer, a thinner with it. It's just the hardener. So, yeah, I just have the hardener here. And, yeah, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about paint, about materials for now, because depending on the brands you decide to use, it's going to be very different. And the brands could be very different depending on where you are in the world. This is just my cleanup thinner. So you always need to have a lot of cleanup thinner. For cleaning out your gun and you can see this is all for cleaning my gun I also have a microfiber for cleaning the gun mixing container with ratios makes it really really easy whatever it says on the on the can you know it's all written on the side here so that's great mixing stick and just a screwdriver to obviously open the paint need a good mask I have a 3m mask you need to keep these filters clean there's an external organic vapor filter which you need to replace when it gets clogged the internal ones last a lot longer you need some good gloves and I really like these nitride gloves from DNA but yeah generally just the black gloves they work really well and yeah I think that's, that's about it I have a lot of cleanup thinner over here because you know you do go through a fair bit so that's a 20 liter drum that I can refill from Okay, the compressor. Now this is going to vary depending on where you are in the world. There's a lot of different brands across the globe. I'm not even sure what brand I have here, but I know that it's very high end. It's a great compressor, but that's the specs that you need to be thinking about just there. So liters per minute, 468. And I think the maximum pressure is about 150 PSI. To be honest, I don't know a whole lot about it because I was just went into the, the local air tool store, told them what I was going to be doing, and they set me up with this. They said this thing will last me 30 years. So that's what I suggest you do also. But 
Here you can see that we have, this should come with your compressor, you know, a, a pressure gauge, the adjustment here. So this is how you adjust the pressure up and down. There's kind of a delay with this. So there it goes. Now, I usually run this at 60 PSI. The reason I run it so high is because I'm adjusting the pressure again at the gun. And I want to have that extra pressure there so that I can, you know, definitely get the pressure I need without any pressure drop due to the length of the airline. So this is a water catch just here. You can open the bottom and that lets out the condensation. Because the motor generates heat, you get a lot of condensation in the tank and then that comes through the airline and it ends up on the surface of your paint job and destroys it. So you need to be really careful of that. You need to keep this thing nice and dry and empty. And you'll notice that I have, you know, this quite a length of airline between the tank and this. And that's so that the, the air can cool down a bit before it comes into here so that the fluid can separate from the air because when it's too hot, it'll just go straight past and, you know, stay as vapor. So yeah, if you add, so this is the, some of the things you can do that will really help you to, to get a perfect finish. You know, I, it's, I was playing around with all this stuff for a long time before I was really happy with it, but that's two meters before the water catch for it to cool down. And then I have another very, very fine water catch, which is actually for my sandblaster, but I've just thrown it on here to get that little bit of extra protection from fluid. But this is a very high-end compressor. You don't need to go this far. You can actually pick up something for, I don't know, the first one I had was like $300 or something. Okay, so it's time to mix up some paint and get started. Now, unfortunately, I cannot teach you how to spray in a single video. It is something that takes many years of practice. You know, it doesn't matter how much research and, and information you take in and how good you are at listening, you are just going to have to get out there and start practicing. It took me five years to get a paint job that I was actually truly happy with, that was actually 100% perfect in every way. Prior to that, there was, you know, a few that I was proud of, but they're never 100%. There's always a piece of dust or something that lands on the surface or something little that goes wrong. And then it kind of, for me, ruins the whole thing, even though it's still a good paint job. But you know what I mean? It takes a long time to get it right. Now, you'll see me spraying and it I'll make it look easy. I'm not being big-headed. It's just that I've had a lot of practice. And so that's the way it will look. It's just the way it is. But, you know, don't let that confuse you about how challenging this actually is. Because what it really comes down to, you know, the gun that you have, all of the adjustments that you've set up, the way you've set them up, how thin the paint is, the type of paint, the conditions, the temperature, everything plays a part. There are so many variables. And you know, the fan, how far away you hold the gun from the surface, how quickly you move the gun as you're spraying, all of this plays a part. But the only thing that matters is the finish that you are getting. So set up as best you can, but then forget about all of those things, just get them out of your head and just look at one thing while you were spraying and think of nothing else and that is the finish. The finish is going to be hard to see with some paints it's easy you know if you have a black paint and you have bright white light shining on it you're going to be able to see absolutely every little detail but you can see here I have a white primer and I have a lot of bright white light which you really need this is how your lighting should be set up from every angle and from above because that finish is something that you need to be watching very closely because it is everything you know if it doesn't seal up 
then you need to sp spray more paint on the surface. If it's dry and dusty, well then there's too much air and not enough paint. If it has a lot of orange peel, well there might not be enough air volume and pressure. If there's runs, well you're obviously spraying too much on the surface or your paint might be too thin. You know, orange peel might also mean that your paint is too thick. So all of these things you need to be looking at and you need to be adjusting along the way to get that finish right. Coverage is also obviously important, but you know, if you're thinking about sealing up the surface, about not getting orange peel, then coverage is, you know, something you're not really going to notice. But it's it's just a lot to learn and the only way to learn is to get out there and do it and so this is pretty much all I can say about spraying the more you watch people do it you know the more you can learn about it I think so if you can watch what I'm doing here and watch some professional painters spray and if you watch closely and you watch the finish the paint actually landing on the surface it will teach you a lot that's probably the most you will learn out of this entire video is watching me spray. I've just finished spraying, doing the primer, and I've just cleaned out the gun. I spend probably 15 minutes cleaning out my gun every time I spray, and I dismantle it. So this part comes off, there's a thread just there. There's a thread here, this comes off, and then with a ring spanner, you can get the internals off. You know, all the guns are pretty similar. You can unscrew this all the way out, and then you can pull out the pin that goes right through and you can actually just see the tip of the pin just there and the spring and you can clean all that up and then just you know anything visible on the outside of the gun so that it always looks new if you continue to get all of that paint off every time you know you don't just get a, a constant build up so that's why I work so hard to keep it clean put a lot of time into it because you see some guys get a bit careless and each time you get a slight amount of build up Eventually, the gun is just an absolute mess, but you can see even after thousands of hours, this one still looks brand new. So you can see the panels here in primer, and they've all come up really nice. I'm really happy. Now, you can see the massive extraction I have over there. That is a huge amount of extraction, and this is quite a large booth, but still, you see the amount of overspray on the floor because I've vacuumed this section that over there is thick overspray, you know, and it's also all over the walls and everywhere. So you can imagine if I wasn't spraying inside of a booth, the amount of mess that this would cause. So some sort of booth is quite important. The bigger it is and the more extraction it has, the better it's going to work. If you don't have enough extraction, you get too much paint in the air and it flies around and dries and lands back on the surface and actually it gets so bad that the surface won't even seal up anymore and when you go to spray base coat on there it won't even take to it properly like that's how bad it can get 
if you're not getting enough extraction. So if you see a lot of paint in the air, it's a good idea to just stop spraying and you know, at least wait for whatever extraction you have to, to remove the, the paint from the air. And then when it's a bit cleaner again, you know, you can start again. Because I actually started with a single extraction fan and that wasn't enough and I had to wait for it quite often to catch up. Anyway, I've covered a lot of info. I hope this is going to be helpful. Thanks for watching and rem remember that none of this would be possible without our customers and our patrons.